The Roman Catholic said, these are one and the same thing. If you are outside of the Roman Catholic Church, you are not saved. But along came Vatican II, which agrees with the Protestants, which said we must understand that local churches are only in the universal body of Christ, because in Hebrews 12, the church of the firstborn and the elect of God are in heaven and on earth, comprised of all believers, those who've gone on, those who are here, the church triumphant, the church militant. No group has the right to claim that it is identical with the body of Christ and you don't belong to them, you are not saved. I submit that the churches of Christ have carried on the old medieval Roman Catholic mentality. They are the true church, what the old priest used to tell us. Their baptism is the only baptism that is valid. That's what the Roman Catholics always said. Alexander Campbell and his crew were not a new reformation, they were undoing the reformation. They were taking us back to the dark ages of Roman Catholicism where the elders act as priests and run the lives of every believer and where they push their church as the true church, their baptism as the true baptism. And then they went on their campaigns to destroy any and all other Christians because the Protestants were not Christians. Yes, there too, the Roman Catholics said, Calvinists are not Christians. The churches of Christ say, Calvinists are not Christians. The Roman Catholics said Lutherans are not Christians. And I submit that we have come full circle back to Roman Catholicism. Instead of having the Pope with his mitre, each little church of Christ has his own Pope. And he dispenses the mediums of grace through his holy sacraments, and he condemns any and all churches. And it's amazing to me that modern Roman Catholicism gave up on this view that their church was the true church, but the banner was lifted high by those who follow Anders and Alexander Campbell when those who started the Reformation movement must be condemned as unsaved men, for they themselves were never baptized unto remission of sin. He listed 12 reasons why, in his words, Campbellite baptism was, uh, if you will, not effective or whatever the particular word was that he used. I'd like to just take a moment to discuss these, but I want to tell you right now, and I do find it astonishing that, uh, you know, and I admitted to him, I told Dr. Morey last night, and I told him on the telephone when we talked a couple of weeks ago, that I'm a novice at this. This is my first debate. I've never debated anybody in my life. And so I'm perhaps a little confused on the rules of debate. I always thought that when the affirmative defines the proposition and makes the argument, the negative was supposed to deal with his argument. I don't know why I thought that, but I, I always thought that, that was the case. I do find it astonishing that he did not mention one time Mark 16 and verse 16. Okay? Now, the thing is, this is the last time I have an opportunity to talk to you other than the question and answer period. So if he brings it up in his last speech... I won't have a chance to reply to you. So maybe that's why he didn't mention it. And I think my moderator said he had uh, a total of eight minutes left. So he, not that he didn't have the time, he had at least eight minutes, I believe, uh, left in his speech. What did he say? Well, again, it's not my uh, responsibility to talk about his argument. He's supposed to prove or negate mine. But I will at least mention these for the sake of the audience this evening. First off, he's talking about men again. He said that the restorers were never saved. Well, that's neither here nor there. As far as I'm concerned, I said I'm not here to defend any man except myself and Jesus Christ. The fact is, he also makes the claim that the churches of Christ teach that the only one who has the legitimate right to baptize you is one of them. I must confess to you, I, I told you before, I've been a Christian since 1968, and I don't suppose I've ever heard anybody say that. Now, maybe they've said it and I've just missed it, and I guess I should tell you, since he went back to my first argument, and he mentioned again about the college, or he mentioned again, rather, about uh, the thing that he said to say about uh, Campbell, I will tell you this, and that is that when I was at Florida College, since he brought it up, I never took one course in restoration history. And the fact of the matter is, I don't believe I read in, to in total more than a page of what Campbell ever wrote, and probably reading that from quoting from somebody else. 
faith and repentance. But baptism does not fit this. It was not in the Old Testament. The unity of God is against it. Sixthly, Paul argued that justification was always by faith apart from the works of the law. Abraham was justified by faith before the law was ever given. David was justified by faith after the law. So Paul says it doesn't matter whether you're before the law or after the law. You're saved by faith apart from obedience to the law. Can any Campbellite produce just one verse which says justification is by baptism? No. Seventhly, baptism is the New Testament parallel to circumcision, according to Colossians 2, uh, verses 11 through 12, just as the Lord's Supper is the parallel to the Passover. Since circumcision, according to Paul, quote, is nothing, end quote, and circumcision did not save anyone, then why should baptism, its exact parallel in the New Testament? Eight, Paul points out that Abraham was justified by faith before he was circumcised, which would be the Old Testament parallel to baptism. He was justified before he was circumcised, just like we are justified by faith before we get baptized. Question, doesn't the Campbellite doctrine destroy the parallel between circumcision and baptism? Yes, it does. It destroys the biblical parallel between those two things. Number nine, Cornelius believed the gospel, was saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, and then he got baptized. Did not Cornelius' salvation take place before he was baptized? Or are we led to believe, as one Church of Christ preacher told me, Cornelius was a child of the devil, unsaved, unregenerate, filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues? No way. Number 10, the thief on the cross went to heaven without baptism. Since Christ died before the thief died, the thief went to paradise through the shed blood of Christ. In Hebrews, it says the death of the testator of the covenant must take place once it does. The covenant is in effect. The thief went to heaven on the basis of the new covenant for Christ's blood had been shed for him. If baptism is essential to salvation, among other things, how did the thief on the cross get there without being baptized? Eleven, the Campbellite doctrine makes salvation dependent upon the availability of water. And of, a, and of a Campbellite to baptize you with their special view. While someone who is alone can believe in Jesus, regardless if he's in the desert or the North Pole, will his salvation be denied because no Campbellite is running around to baptize him? His faith in Christ is not enough? I think that the gospel cannot depend upon the availability of water. Imagine long space trips or other planets one day if the Lord tarries, where there's no water for the Campbellites to get anybody. Number 12, the Campbellite doctrine confuses the symbol with what it represents. It is based on a superstitious and magical view of baptism. Since the Campbellites admit that the bread and the wine are symbols of the body and blood of Jesus, and they don't take it literally, then on what grounds do they confuse baptism and salvation? Baptism is a symbol of salvation just as much as the implements of Holy Communion. Conclusion, the Campbellites twist the scriptures to their own destruction. 2 Peter 3.16, they try to mix works with grace. When Paul said, if it's of grace, it cannot be of works. If it's of works, it cannot be of grace. You can't mix them. Salvation is by grace, through faith, in Christ, apart from the works of the law, such as baptism, church membership, obedience to the elders, and the thousand and one other things that the Campbellites throw in. To make salvation dependent on the presence of baptism and the absence of a piano, I submit as ridiculous as well as unscriptural. He did ask me one question, which I will at this time answer. The historic Protestant position over against the Vatican I Roman Catholic position needs to be pointed out. The original Roman Catholic position given at the time of the Reformation is that when you're discussing the body of Christ and the visible church, 
Three words of introduction, please. Notice that Mr. Andrews has not offered a single piece of evidence, no dictionaries, no encyclopedias, no theologians, no scholars, nothing. Number two, he has spent his time attacking Briarwood Presbyterian when that was never part of the debate that I know of, or my character or the character of Mr. Branch, I don't believe were part of the theses. He was called upon and he'd accepted the challenge to defend Campbellism. That is the term that appeared in the newspaper. But he has done what is called the switch and bait routine. That is, when you can't defend your position, just attack the character of the other person, argumentum ad hominem ad ridiculum. Thirdly, in terms of math, I will use 43 verses. Mr. Andrews has used one. If my football math is correct, it's 43 to 1. Twelve reasons why Campbellite baptism is not essential to salvation. Notice that we are not discussing baptism in general as if any old baptism will do. The Campbellites are referring to only those baptisms performed by them according to their view. No one else's baptisms are viewed as valid, not even those done by other Campbellite cults such as the Mormons, the Christadelphians, and the rest of them. So we're only talking about Campbellite baptism. The reason that Mr. Andrews is struggling on the hook, trying desperately to escape from his history, is this fatal error. The Campbellite doctrine of baptism, if it is really true, means that the restorers, Alexander and Thomas Campbell, Barton Stone and Walter Scott, were sons and of the devil and were unsaved because they were never baptized in the Campbellite way. All they had was the infant baptism they received from the Presbyterians, and they claimed that they were saved men while they were in Scotland. Then they got baptized by the Baptists, and what Campbellite accepts Baptist baptism, and the, and the leaders, the restorers of the Reformation movement, while they demanded everybody else be baptized a third time or a second time, they never got baptized. They were never saved. How in the world can my opponent, church, gospel, and baptism be of God when the very men who supposedly dropped the seed and restored it according to their own teaching were unsaved children of the devil? That's a question I wish he would answer. I don't have much hope that he will, though. Secondly, John the Baptist's baptism did not save anyone, although it was done for the remission of sins, according to Mark 1.4. Everybody knows that people who had John's baptism got rebaptized with Christian baptism. If John's baptism didn't save anybody, and he said it was only water, then why does Christian baptism save anybody when it's simply done, quote, for the remission of sins? Thirdly, Jesus never baptized anyone. That's very funny. If baptism is essential to salvation, why didn't he ever baptize or save anybody? So if baptism is essential for salvation, why didn't Jesus even bother to baptize one person? Fourthly, Paul clearly states that baptism is not part of gospel preaching. You look it up in 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 17. He said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And he makes the distinction between the two things. Then in chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, when he summarizes and defines the gospel, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached unto you. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. There is no reference to baptism in the gospel. The same thing when he summarized it in Acts 20 and 21. He went forth preaching repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How can Campbellite baptism be essential to salvation when it is not part of gospel preaching? Fifthly, Paul argues in Romans 3, 28 through 30, that since there is only one God, there can only be one way of salvation for the Gentile, the Goyim, as well as for the Hasidim, for the Jew. It doesn't matter. There's only one God. This means that whatever is essential to salvation now was the same throughout all ages. P 
people repented and had faith in God. Look unto me, you all into the earth, and you shall be saved from Isaiah. Thus, there's only one way of salvation throughout all dispensations. Paul's key phrase, before God, James' key phrase, show me and I will show you. Second question says, uh, since you say it takes more than two conditions to salvation, how can Mark 16, 16 be correct, which has only two conditions? If you say five conditions, aren't you denying Mark 16, 16? What I said at the very beginning of my, second, I mean, my first affirmative was that I believe that there's more to salvation than just baptism. And what I believe is quite simple. I believe you have to take everything that God said on the subject of salvation. The problem with Dr. Morey and men of his ilk, I hope that was pronounced correctly, is that they will take just the passages that deal with faith, nothing more than that, just the ones that deal with faith and say, see, you're saved by faith. And it's true, you are saved by faith, but you're not saved by faith alone. You have to understand that a man has to also repent. Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You have to confess Christ as Lord. You have to be immersed in water for the remission of sins. All of those things are necessary. As far as uh, what Dr. Morey had to say about historical narrative, he said you shouldn't get your doctrine from the, histor from the historical narratives. He didn't say it in those words, but he meant from the Gospels. What's interesting is who says so? And the fact of the matter is, if it's true, then please establish without historical narrative the doctrine of the virgin birth. Where can you find in the epistles that Christ was born of a virgin? It's in the Gospels. It's in the historical narratives. That's doctrine. Where can you find that adultery is the grounds for divorce and remarriage? You only find it in the Gospels. Paul says, Every scripture inspired of God is given for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. Doctrine. Every scripture. Evidently, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts aren't inspired, according to Dr. Morey. In Acts chapter 10, the question has to do, is not Acts chapter 10 Cornelius the fatal flaw of cannibalism. Yes, it is. Verse 44, Peter was preaching. As he was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. They began to speak in tongues. Peter was amazed. He said these people had received the Holy Spirit just in the same way they had received the Holy Spirit because they were believers because they had been filled with the Spirit of God, because they were now speaking in tongues as evidence of that for the Gentiles' Pentecost, then and only then were they baptized. Why? Because faith and repentance always precede baptism, because you do not baptize unbelievers, you do not baptize unrepentant sinners, you baptize people who have repented, who have believed, thus they have become the children of God. You baptize Christians, you baptize believers, you do not baptize savages who are the children of the devil, unrepentant, unbelieving. If the Campbellite position is true, we should read the order, they were baptized and then they repented and they believed. But the Word of God does not teach that. The last question says, how can you say a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian saved by faith and submerged in baptism is not saved? When I was on the radio with Craig Branch back in June, somebody called in and asked that question. And at that time, I made the statement. I said, ladies and gentlemen, I don't judge. I'm not the one on the day of judgment who's going to stand up there and tell you if you're saved or you're lost. And I remember that when I made that statement, Craig just jumped all over me and said, oh, you're dodging the question. Well, I don't believe I'm dodging the question. The fact is, God didn't make me the judge. It's not up to me to decide who's saved or who's lost. It's up to me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But let me make this point. Who has the right? to sit in God's place and say that a person who's believed and is not baptized shall be saved. That's judgment as well. First off, I'd like to thank Dr. Morey because he did bring out a point, a mistake that I made. I appreciate that. The mistake was that uh, Jesus, in fact, did die before the thief. I appreciate him pointing that out to me. There is hope for me. All right.
This has been a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Morey. For more of Dr. Morey's audio presentations, videos, books, tracts, and more, call 1-800-41-TRUTH. That's 1-800-41 and the word truth. Or visit faithdefenders.com. The proclamation of Christ, the epistles, the explanation of Christ. There we find, particularly in the book of Romans, that when Paul outlines the plan of salvation, baptism is not mentioned until you get to chapter 6, which deals with sanctification. Shall we sin after we have been saved? He nowhere deals with baptism in connection with justification in chapters 4 and 5. It is never mentioned. It is not part of justification. Thus, in terms of Mark 16, no, it is not in the Greek. I stand with the scholars. I do lecture on textual criticism. If anyone needs information on the Sinaiticus and the Alexandrius and other types of manuscripts, I'm more than willing to help them to understand that. First question that I have says, uh, why did Jesus not mention the lack of baptism as a grounds for damnation? And I'd just like to tell you that what Jesus had to say was, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus did not say, he that believeth and is, ba is not baptized shall be saved. Now, how do I answer that question? Well, think of this. He that eateth his food and digesteth it shall live. He that does not eat shall die. Now, is it necessary for me to tell you that he that does not eat and does not digest his food shall die? Why do I need to negate the second statement when the first one is enough to eliminate it? The fact is, if a person will not believe in Jesus Christ, then he will not be baptized. It's just that simple. Jesus did not have to say, he that does not believe and is not baptized. Shall be, say, shall be lost. Now, Dr. Morey did mention that he agrees with the scholars. Is it inspired? Mark 16, 9 through 20, is it inspired? It is absolutely true that the Alexandrian manuscript, uh, uh, which is considered next to the Vatican, in accuracy contains these verses. It's also true that Hebrews 2, 4 refers directly to the last verses of Mark 16. 47 translators of the King James Version and 101 translations of the American Standard Version include these verses. Irenaeus, who lived 170 A.D., quoted from Mark 16, 9 through 20, 200 years before either the Sinaitic or the Vatican manuscripts were made. He referred to it as a part of the Gospel of Mark. It's true. Two manuscripts omit it. 2,000 contain it. And yet, he's going to agree with the scholars. And by the way, on scholarship, the only scholarship God recognizes is those who look at his word. Genuineness confirmed of Mark 16. Here are all these passages that deal with Mark 16. The name is Irenaeus, not Irenaeus. The question has to do with the old bugaboo of the book of James when he says, was, were they not justified by works? If you look at this diagram and look at the scriptures, the difference between what Paul is talking about and what James is talking about. If you look at the Apostle Paul in Romans 4, 1 through 2, he says he is discussing justification before God, not before man. But when you turn to the book of James, he says that he's dealing with justification before man, not before God. That's why chapter 2 and verse, verse 14, though a man say, verse 18, a man may say, verse 18, very important, show me and I will show you. Or verse 24, you see, James is talking about people justifying to him, whether or not they have a true faith. Paul speaks of faith because God alone can see faith in the heart. No one else can. But James speaks of a living faith which produces works in the outward life of a man which can be seen and examined by other people so he could say, 
Prove to me that you are truly a believer. Number three, Paul refers to Genesis 15, 6, where Abraham is converted before he was ever circumcised. Uh, Paul does. James refers instead to the sacrifice of Isaac, which was proof in his sanctification. This was separated by years. Two different instances. Died after the new covenant took effect, number one. Number two, his view saying that the thief was under the old covenant makes salvation easier if you were a Jew under the old covenant than if you were under the new covenant. I would rather be a Jew who believed in Jesus and went straight to heaven than have to have all of these little rules that supposedly the new covenant puts. Whereas the apostle Paul said there is only one God and thus salvation is always one. I will answer no problem with Mark 16 during the question and answer period, but I want to direct your attention in my time to a few verses he didn't deal with. For example, Matthew 3.11 says, baptize unto repentance. Does this mean that unrepentant people were baptized so that they could obtain repentance? That's nonsense. The little Greek word ace, the word unto simply means these people were baptized in the view or in view of, in reference to the fact they had already repented. This is why such translations, the Amplified, be baptized because of repentance. The Renaissance, because of. Phillips, as a sign of. Goodspeed, in token of. Williams, to picture. 20th century, to teach. The Living Bible, baptize those who repent of their sins. Very important passage. Matthew 12 and verse 41. The people at Nineveh repented, ace, unto the preaching of Jonah. Does this mean that they repented in order that they might obtain the preaching? Or did they repent in view of the preaching which had already taken place? That's why modern translations point out they repented because of the preaching. It means in view of. Thus the favorite passage, and this is the first time that I've dealt with Church of Christ preachers, that they didn't use Acts 2.38. How many of you are amazed that the old club wasn't drawn out? Well, the reason is that when you look in the Greek, and my opponent has admitted he has no scholarship, he didn't attend the lectures at his college, he doesn't bother reading books, so, and I have to give him a lecture on textual criticism later. But Matthew 3.11 says, Baptize ace repentance, Matthew 12.41, Repented ace preaching, Acts 2.38, Baptize ace forgiveness. Very simple to understand. They were baptized in the light of the fact that their sins had been forgiven. This is why you will have Bible translations and Greek scholars that state these things. I submit that the debate had to do with Campbellism. My opponent spent 30% of his time ranting against the Presbyterians, which certainly were not part of the debate. I submit that I've given you the evidence from every conceivable scholarly source. My opinion, my opponent has only given you his opinion and nothing else. Disputant will answer three questions. We'll alternate. Dr. Morey will go first. He'll read one question. He'll give a two-minute reply to it. And Mr. Andrews will come up with his first question, and he'll give a two-minute reply, and we'll go through until each has answered three questions. We'll begin with Dr. Morey. The first question has to do with Mark 16. Before I do mention that, it is John 19, verses 30 and 33, for that textual criticism uh, mistake. The first question has to do with Mark 16. Yes, I state with all other scholars that that passage was not in the original Greek text. That is why every Bible translation has a footnote which states, beginning with verse 9, these were not found in the most ancient manuscripts. Later, when endings were found, you found three different. Thus, it is not found there according to the evidence. Number two, 
unbelief is the basis of condemnation, not the lack of baptism. Number three, hermeneutically, that is in terms of principles of interpreting scripture, doctrine should always come primarily from the epistles where you have the explanation of redemption. The gospels comprise the manifestation of Christ. The book of Acts didn't even touch it. Jesus the one who said that. Not me. All I'm going to do is what Jesus tells me to do. And the fact is, I suppose what I'd have to do is probably fill up one of them craters with water, I guess. I don't know, or fill up the bathtub or whatever they got. I'd have to do something if somebody on that spacecraft and I was there or another gospel preacher was there and that person wanted to be baptized. I don't know what else to do other than that. Do you? And then there's the problem of, conver of confusing the symbol with what it represents. Well, that's interesting. What does it represent? Seems to me the Apostle Paul said something about that over in Romans chapter 6. And it seems to me that he, what he says it represents is the death of Christ. And the fact that Christ died and was buried and rose again. And that when we die to our sins and we are buried in water, we are raised again to walk in newness of life. Now, if I'm confusing baptism with the symbol, that's all right, because that's the symbol. And you know, it confirms perfectly well to what Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Um... That was an interesting chart that he pulled out here, the chart on the local churches or in the body of Christ. And you know what I really thought was interesting about that? Because I had asked him the question, and that's all right, he can answer it. I asked him the question, did he believe that he was in the church that was established in the New Testament days? The New Testament church, the one true church of the Bible, the one Jesus established. You know what he uses as proof? Vatican II. I thought that was amazing. He didn't bother to go to the Bible and see what the Bible had to say about it. He consulted Roman Catholicism to see what they had to say about it. And then he says, you know what? It's Roman Catholicism all over again. But the very first words out of his mouth was, what? The, the Catholics finally got it right. Who's agreeing with the Catholics here? Him or me? He's the one standing up here saying that it's Catholicism. Uh, how much time do I have left, Mr. Irwin? Six minutes. All right. I believe that dealt with most of what he had to say. Uh, and I should also mention the fact that he did not mention Mark 16, 16, so I will. Let's have that chart again, Mark 16, 16. Uh, what's that chart number? Do you happen to know that, Steve? I don't happen to have my charts with me. We'll get it out here in just a minute. While they're pulling it out, let's remember what's going on here. Jesus is at the Mount of Ascension. Here he is giving the Great Commission. He's, a, he's, a, he's commissioning his apostles, and that's the emphasis here. Jesus is telling his apostles that they're to go out and they're to preach the gospel to every creature. Which one? 21. They're to preach the gospel to every creature. What was a part of that gospel? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Thank you. There it is. That's it. Now, how difficult is that to understand? The apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2 that Timothy was to take the things that he had received from Paul and he was to teach other men and they were to go out, a faithful man, they were to go out and teach others also. You know what they were to teach him? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's what Jesus said. Now, Dr. Morey, this is the passage he needed to deal with. He didn't mention it one time. You know, as far as those other arguments are concerned, I'll tell you right now, since this is the last time I get to talk to you, I am happy to discuss those in open debate with a legitimate, reasonable amount of time. He hasn't even mentioned that again, has he? Will he accept the debate? Can we talk about all these scriptures that he brought up and that he introduced? Can we deal with all of these things in an open and an honest way? Or are we going to be left with two hours to discuss these issues that are so important? I uh, give you the rest of my time. Let me first respond to some of the things. As you will notice that in any debate, each of the opponents hurl questions at the other. I have submitted over 20 questions, I believe, to Mr. Andrews. He hasn't answered any of them. I will deal with uh, certain passages of Scripture. During the question and answer period, we can deal with others. But I want you to notice something as the modus operandi. I'm quoting Charles Andrews, the thief died before Jesus. If you look in John 20 and verse 30, 
Jesus died. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and he died. Later they came, and they, the two thieves were still alive, and they said, we have to break their legs, and they killed them. But lo and behold, when they came to Jesus, it said he was already dead. The word of God tells us that the thief... So he cannot stand up here and say that I'm steeped in that as far as theology is concerned because I've never really addressed myself to it. What I'm interested in is this. It is interesting, too. He said, I didn't have any sources of information. What's this? I think that's the only source of information you really have to deal with, and that's exactly why I'm here. This is what I want to deal with. John the Baptist. I mentioned in my proposition that we're talking about someone who's under the covenant of grace. We're talking about after the Lord's church was established, which he admitted was established in the first century after the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We're not dealing with John the Baptist's baptism here. He said Jesus never baptized anyone, and that's no wonder, considering the fact that Jesus uh, would not baptize somebody into his death, which is what baptism is, because he wasn't dead. He had never died while he was on the earth in his public ministry. But again, that's beside the point. He said that baptism is not a part of the gospel because Paul's claim in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14 through 17, was that Christ sent him to preach and not to baptize. And you know what? That's exactly what Paul said. He sent me to preach and not to baptize. And you know what Paul meant by that? And I'm sure Dr. Morey understands this. He meant that it's not my job to physically take you and baptize you. My job is to preach the gospel. Who does the baptism makes no difference. But you know one thing he forgot to tell you? Everybody at Corinth was baptized. And some had been baptized by Apollos and some by Paul and some by into Christ, of Christ is the way he puts it. The fact of the matter is that what they were talking about was who did the teaching. And they had, sector, they had sector, uh, the, divided themselves. That's the word I'm looking for. They had divided themselves and put themselves in little groups at Corinth and said... Paul's the one who taught me. Paul said, no, 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 you have to understand, Jesus Christ is the one who's important. Just because I might have been the one to baptize you, that's not the point. Romans chapter 3 speaks about the fact that we're justified apart from the works of the law. He also made that point in number 6. That's absolutely true. We are justified apart from the works of the law. What he has to demonstrate is that baptism is a work of the law. He hadn't demonstrated that. And then he said that New Testament baptism is parallel to circumcision. Well, that's interesting. And in fact, the Apostle Paul does call it that in Colossians chapter 2. The thing is, though, he says it's symbolic of, of, of uh, circumcision. And it certainly is. I don't have any argument with that. That's Paul's point. The one thing, though, he doesn't want to deal with is the fact that if it is parallel to circumcision in the Old Testament covenant, then all the people we're going to baptize are males who are six days old or eight days old. I forget, what is it, six or eight, Dr. Moore? Oh, never mind. Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. That's true, but we're talking about New Testament baptism. We're not talking about Abraham here. We're talking about those who fall under the covenant of grace. He mentions Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Peter tells us why God gave them the Holy Spirit. Because Peter, as a Jew, was going with his brethren to preach to the Gentiles. Who ever heard of such a thing? Peter's preaching to them, and he tells us in Acts chapter 11, he's thinking to himself, what if this guy wants to be baptized? What am I going to do? And that's when he makes the point that when they receive the Spirit just as we in the beginning, he was talking about the apostles, that's who he was talking to in Acts 11. When they received it just as we in the beginning, who was I to forbid them baptism? I couldn't. His point was, was the reason they received the Spirit was it required a divine intervention by God to convince Peter that the Gentiles could receive the gospel. That was the point of the vision in Acts 10, coming down with the animals. You can take your time to look at that. Thief on the cross. I said specifically we're talking about those under the covenant of grace. The thief did not live under the covenant of grace. He died before Jesus Christ died, uh, evidently. And the fact is, Jesus Christ had the power to forgive anybody he wanted to at any time. And quite frankly, if Jesus Christ can say to a thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, hallelujah, I have no problem with that. And the thief doesn't have to be baptized because he didn't live under the covenant of grace. And then, 
He tells us that you got to have water. And why in the world would you confine baptism or confine salvation to the necessity of water? After all, you might get on the moon someday or Mars, and you're not going to have any water out there. What are you going to do then? Well, the fact of the matter is that uh, if God hadn't thought about that, I don't guess I need to think about that, do I? God is the one who told me, excuse me, Jesus Christ is the one who said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The verse he didn't bother to deal with, not one time, even though he had eight minutes left. 